Hello class, it's Ms. Augustine. Um, I'm not able to be with you for a few more days, so I'm going to try to record a video for you every day. Uh, hopefully you've got the Chapter 13 packets that Mr. Palmer copied for me. So we're going to start talking about electrons in atoms, and this is Chapter 13. So we begin with a brief review of models. Uh, you'll recall that we talked about Democritus first, who was the first person to mention atoms existed, and that was in the 4th century BC. That was followed by Dalton with his atomic theory, and he believed that uh, atoms are solid and indivisible. Then we started to learn that atoms were divisible. J.J. Thomson discovered the electron using his cathode ray tube, and he also proposed a plum pudding model of the atom. And then Rutherford did a gold foil experiment, and that allowed him to uh, determine that there's a dense positive region in an atom, but that most of the atom is empty space. He's also credited with discovering the proton. And then the next person that we need to talk about is Niels Bohr. And he proposed that electrons actually have a fixed energy and that they have to move at fixed locations called energy levels around the nucleus, which is why they don't fall into the nucleus. And Bohr's model is sometimes called the solar system model. And if you'll remember when we did the FET simulation with the build an atom, how the central region was the nucleus and that then there were electrons in circles outside of the nucleus. And those are these so-called energy levels. And it kind of looks like a solar system with the nucleus being the sun and the energy levels being the planets uh, orbiting around it. So in Bohr's model, the energy levels he proposed were like the rungs of a ladder. And he determined that electrons cannot be in between levels. They have to be at a specific spot. So those specific amounts of energy are required. And again, in order to move from one level to another, the electron would have to have that specific amount of energy. And again, his model is always referred to as like the rungs of a ladder. The energy levels are moving outward, equally spaced, like the rungs of a ladder from the nucleus. So now we're ready in chapter 13.1, after our brief trip down memory lane, to talk about our current model of the atom, which is known as the quantum mechanical model. So our current model, the first thing to know is that it is the new and current model of the atom. And again, it's referred to as the quantum mechanical model. And it is very similar to Bohr's model with some key exceptions. The first thing to note is that the energy levels are not equally spaced like a ladder. And in fact, the farther away from the nucleus that you get, the closer together the energy levels are. And the higher the energy of the electron, the easier it is to leave the atom. So as you're moving outward from the nucleus, the energy levels get higher in energy and they get closer together. It's also important to note that there is no exact path that an electron takes. Instead, in the quantum mechanical model, we talk about areas of high probability of finding an electron and areas with a low probability of finding an electron. So we don't know its exact location because You'll recall it has a mass of zero and it's moving pretty darn fast. So we talk about areas of high probability and low probability of finding an electron in space. So the way we depict an electron is the probability of finding it and we represent it by something called a fuzzy cloud. And that cloud shows you the area where it is about 90% likely to find an electron. So about 10% of the time, it could be outside of that cloud region. So these fuzzy cloud regions that we refer to are what we determined, what we call atomic orbitals. And the atomic orbitals are the locations where you're likely to find an electron outside of an atom's nucleus, and they go through 
a series of names and numbers and those little addresses tell you exactly where the electron is in space. So the first way that we determine where an electron is is something called the principal or main energy levels and those are assigned numbers according to their energy and they are integers so they're numbered as integers and n is used to depict the principal energy level and they are integers 1, 2, 3, 4 and actually they go from 1 through 7 with 1 being the lowest energy and it's important to note that the lowest energy as I said previously is the energy that uh, corresponds to being closest to the nucleus so as the numbers increase you're getting farther and farther from the nucleus so each of the principal energy levels then has one or more sublevels so the number of sublevels is very straightforward it's the same as the number of that particular principal energy level so that would mean that at principal level one there's one sublevel and it has a name it's called 1s and then at the second level there's two sublevels and they go s and then p and then the third principal energy level has three sublevels and those are called s p and d and the fourth level uh, principal level has four sublevels and those are called s p D and F. Now you might ask yourself why S, P, D, and F? Um, that's just one of those things that I'm not going to get into at this level, but um, just know that they always are S being the first, P is the second, D is the third, and F is the fourth. And it actually goes S, P, D, F, and then G, H, I. Not quite sure why they started with S and P but that's just the way it is. So then breaking down into the sublevels, each S sublevel has only one orbital to it, and orbitals are kind of like the bedrooms where um, the electrons could take place. So you can talk in terms of an energy level has a specific number of sublevels so those would be the bedrooms and then with each sublevel how many beds are in there so each s sublevel has only one orbital so it has one uh, place for the electrons to hang out and that you can think of um, in terms of it having one bunk bed in it so an s sublevel has one orbital and that one orbital can hold two electrons and you can think of that as being a bunk bed. Each P sublevel has three orbitals so we can think of it as a P sublevel having three bedrooms and each of those bedrooms has a bunk bed in it and the P sublevel uh, orbitals are called X, Y, and Z and they are located on the X, Y, and Z axes when you talk about a 3D space. And then each D sublevel, oops, sorry, each D sublevel has five orbitals, so that's like the D sublevel has five bedrooms, and again, they have these funny names, X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z, X squared minus Y squared, and Z squared. And finally, the F sublevel has seven orbitals, and I'm not even going to get into how complex those are. So now, when we're doing a little summary of all of this, we have our principal energy level, and then we have the number of sublevels that can take place at a particular level. So here you'll see I have at the first principal energy level, the energy level closest to the nucleus, there's one sublevel, and its flavor is S at n equals 2 there are two sublevels so there are the s and the p flavors at n equals 3 there are three sublevels s p and d and at n equals 4 s p d and f four sublevels we're not going to go beyond uh, the fourth principal energy level but i wanted to show you briefly some visualizations this is from the university of colorado and 
I'm going to see if I can show you orbitals. Well, let, let me show you orbitals. 